special guest here today with us. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Kenneth Steyer, uh, DO. Uh, I'm a, a pulmonary and critical care physician, uh, and I'm the uh, executive dean of the Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, which has campuses in uh, Harlem, uh, New York, and upstate New York and Middletown. Perfect. So how do you anticipate the coronavirus affecting med school applications? Okay, well, so right now we're finishing our um, current admission process. We're just at the very end. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, yesterday I interviewed about, uh, well, I spoke to about 25 uh, new applicants, wow. uh, all on Zoom uh, from all over the, the world. I think the furthest, furthest was from Vienna, Austria. Wow. Uh, but a lot of the applicants were in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, where we get most of our applicants from. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 10,000 applicants in our current admission cycle. Uh, we take 135 students uh, in, in each campus, uh, Middletown and Harlem, so 270 total. Uh, and uh, applicants have been going up every year so far. Uh, and uh, the school in Middletown here has been open since 2014, so we're going into our uh, seventh year. And uh, the applicants look very strong. And this was actually the last interview day. So for the last couple of interview days, we've gone to completely virtual online Zoom interviewing, no in-person interviews. And, you know, I must say that's gone very, very well. Um, the uh, students, uh, of course, usually the applicants are in their mid-20s or so. They're very good with technology. They all have at least one laptop, maybe more. Um, you know, their laptops tend to be fully uh, fitted with uh, all the most recent software and equipment, uh, much better than mine, I would say. <laughs> uh, so their skills are, are great. Uh, I think they really prefer the online interview process. They save a lot of money and time traveling. Um, and uh, they, they seem very happy with it. And just like I'm looking at you and talking to you, I looked in and spoke with 25 applicants yesterday uh, in a group setting, it's very comfortable. Uh, with the chat feature on Zoom, they were able to ask questions. And, uh, you know, we spoke for an hour and it was probably just as good or better than the uh, in-person uh, interview and application process. So, but your question is different. Your question is moving yeah, forward. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. No, but that actually is a really good point though. Like for the, you know, the online calls, the online interview format, do you think that the school might transition more to that moving forward? Or do you think that in-person is kind of the traditional way? It will stay that way. You know, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think what we've discussed, the whole medical school, by the way, since March is online. So all of our courses are online, all our teaching is online, everything is done through Zoom, even the exams. This past Monday, we had our first set of exams online. And you can use remote proctoring if you're worried about securing uh, the exams. You can use some kind of lockdown browser. Uh, to prevent students from going on other websites while they're taking the exam. And, uh, in terms of the medical school part, the, the students really, I think, like that a lot better too. Uh, you know, they can do it from wherever and uh, on the laptop and not be physically present. They can be in Hawaii or California yeah. and participate. So the whole medical school is now online. And I think what this, what we've learned so far from this uh, pandemic um, in terms of medical education is you really can do a lot of online, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more than we thought. I mean, we all kind of dipped our feet, our toes in the water to see what it would be like. So we did some online stuff already before this, but now that we have to do it all online, I think uh, you know the last remaining professors and teachers and students all kind of jumped on board. And I, I think this is, you know, really opening up people's eyes as to what you can do uh, through video conferencing, through like a Zoom or another product uh, on a laptop with a bunch of students in terms of education. So I think this really pushes the envelope. Mm -hmm. A lot of students have said to me, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to go backwards. Uh, you know, when, when this all passes, uh, you know, for people to have to go back and sit in the classroom and you know, try to stay awake and stay attentive for many hours in a day. It's, it's going to seem very tedious and cumbersome compared to what we're doing now. I think the application process, similarly, I think people are going to say, why should I fly from 
uh, Hawaii to, to New York, uh, you know, for however many hours and, you know, a big yeah. cost and, you know, it takes a few days, you know, to get there, get back. And when I can j just do this all, you know, you can ask me the same questions uh, online and I can, you can see me and I can give you the same answers, whether I'm in Hawaii or uh, whether mm -hmm. I'm in, in New York. So I don't think that the in-person you know, thing probably adds all that much. And, it, you know, it's true for telemedicine, too, in practice. I think it's going to really boost telemedicine and people caring for patients online. So I, I think there's a lot of things we're learning. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And that's what I've read, not just in the medical field, but, you know, every single industry is kind of discovering that, you know, online actually kind of is better. It's cheaper in a lot of sense, and you get the same, sometimes the same, like, quality of, interaction and care and all that kind of thing so yeah it's right. really interesting to see where it goes in the next couple of years and for people who who uh, kill themselves commuting all the time like i used to be driving from long island new york uh, huntington where i used to live for like the last 20 years up to middletown which was a two two and a half hour trip each way and i was doing that for about four years every day oh, God. Uh, you know, and, yeah. you know and, and, and I'm not the only one and people mm -hmm. commute from Middletown where I live now, I finally moved up here into the city all the time and that's hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending, uh, each way. Yeah. Uh, I think it, at some point people are gonna really ask themselves, you know, why am I doing all this when I can accomplish so much, you know, completely online without ever leaving my home? and. It's better for the environment, uh, you know, the trees are blooming, uh, pollution is down, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the birds and deer and everybody seem really happy. And, exactly. Uh, you know, and you don't see uh, the gas emissions and everything else going on. So, you know, there's, there's probably a lot to be said for, for this mode uh, of education. Yeah, yeah, I'm really, I am really excited to see what really happens in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, so going back to the kind of the original question is kind of for this upcoming cycle, of course, like, you know, a lot of people have already got their MCAT scores in, in place, um, but for the ones that did get canceled that, you know, the first of, what month are we in, you know, the first of April, last of March, mm -hmm. test dates, um, that may put it like a huge wrench in some people's plans. Do you anticipate med school applications being down, staying the same? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so there's the um, practicality of it, and then there's the emotion of it. So uh, emotionally, it, it's going to be interesting because I think, uh, you know, people see the healthcare workers on TV, you know, the dedication, the passion, uh, you know, the, the excitement, I guess, uh, of what they're doing and saving lives and being in the front line. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to have some appeal for people. It's like a, a real life Grey's Anatomy or, you know, a real life uh, 911 uh, TV okay. show. Uh, but you're actually seeing what doctors do and what other healthcare providers do. So I think it's going to draw, you know, more people to the healthcare profession. And it's going to open up, I think, a lot more jobs and opportunity because people are going to realize that you have to be ready for a surge, like we're seeing with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, there was a shortage of healthcare workers in many fields before the pandemic, and certainly it's a, it's a lot worse now. So I think there's going to be a lot more um, realization that you need a, a vibrant, robust healthcare force. Uh, to handle the surges and emergencies, not just, you know, regular day-to-day -day stuff. So I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunity, which is going to appeal to a lot of people, a lot of excitement, a lot of publicity, uh, and all that. It may scare some people away because of the contagious nature of this pandemic and mm -hmm. the risk that healthcare workers assume when they go into the field. And working in hospitals and you know there's always been some risk there's always been other hepatitis meningitis hiv other diseases and i mean hospitals are filled with sick patients some of whom have contagious diseases so you always had to be very very careful now even more so so it may scare away some people uh, but i think it's going to generate uh, at least on the emotional side a lot more interest and a lot more application on the practicality side, you know, you have to meet all the basic requirements to, to apply to medical school. So you have to finish college, uh, you know, do well, have a good GPA, take the MCAT, do well on that. 
uh, and get you know good letters of support from physicians and mm -hmm. other people that are familiar with you. So on a practicality side, you know, if you're not able to take the MCAT or you're not able to complete your college degree, uh, that that'll slow some people down. Uh, I, I'm reading and hearing about solutions to those things. Even with the MCAT, there can be remote proctoring. Uh, there are things that can be done ultimately, which will probably need to be done. So whether it's the LSATs or the law boards for the legal profession or the MCAT and the board exams for the medical profession, people are going to have to find way, secure ways to do those online. Uh, face recognition, fingerprint, however it can be done. Uh, I'm sure it can be done. So I think that's going to ramp back up, uh, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, so, so I don't I, I don't see um, a big uh, decrease in terms of practicality of applications. Uh, I think we'll, we'll find a way to get that done. And there may be an overall net increase in people's interest in, in healthcare careers to, to battle things like this terrible pandemic, whether you're a scientist or a clinician or an educator, um, you know, battling things like this pandemic. Uh, yeah, I think has really risen to the top of people's uh, attention. Yeah, for sure. So you don't really foresee the application timeline getting pushed back. Everything will kind of continue as normal if kids or students, really adults, have their MCAT scores in place. They have their letters of recommendation. You know, everything it will everything will continue on as normal. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I guess the new normal, right? So yeah, exactly. I, I, I think I, I, I'm sure that there'll be some kind of, you know, lag period. Uh, it may take uh, an extra month or two or three to get people's files complete. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the process starts pretty early. So we're talking about uh, a year from July now would be the next class mm -hmm. to start, right? The current application cycle is for this July. Mm -hmm. So that would, we're talking about the application cycle for, for next July. So, uh, you know, there's still time, uh, you know, the interviews for next July wouldn't start till the fall anyway. Yeah. Uh, so there's still time. Uh, things may get pushed a month or two or three, but I, I, I think ultimately one way or another, um, there'll be a solution to keep the pipeline going because we need more physicians, more healthcare workers, you know, we need people to battle things like this pandemic. We need yeah. committed, you know, empathetic, caring people to get fully trained so they can, you know, make, make their mark in uh, healthcare. Okay. And because the MCAT last at least two cycles, maybe more, have been canceled, has there ever been any consideration, like on your guys' end, of, you know, having the MCAT be more lenient like if you didn't quite get the score that you needed the first time you'll maybe have lower not standards but you know lower requirements or waiving it all together well there, there are medical schools that do not uh, you know use the MCAT mm -hmm. as a screen uh, we only use it as a minimum standard uh, but it's it's only a small part of our holistic admission process mm -hmm. anyway uh, it, you know, MCAT has never been correlated to what kind of physician you are or what kind of person you are. Uh, it's just how you did on the MCAT, you know, the day you took it. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So, uh, you know, for a lot of schools, it, it's not that essential anyway, even prior to this. I imagine more schools, you know, may either waive the MCAT requirement uh, or delay it or offer acceptance pending an MCAT of a certain yeah. minimum number. Uh, there's probably a lot of different ways to to uh, deal with that issue, but uh, the MCAT is, is not as prominent for a lot of medical schools in, in terms of acceptance as it once was, mm -hmm. and this may accelerate the looking at other factors, you know, compassion, empathy, experience, maturity, resilience, you know, the other you know important things to be a physician. Completely agree. Yeah, I think that that's a good idea. It's the same kind of thing that's happened with the undergraduates with the SAT, ACT no longer being as prominent. And I think, you know, how well you do on the SAT or ACT does not show how good you're going to do in med school. Same thing with the MCAT. There's no correlation. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Even though I'll never have to take the MCAT, thank God. I'm happy to hear other people maybe won't have to be so stressed out about it. Yeah, so maybe another unintended uh, benefit, uh, yeah. you know, you know, you hate to say benefit, I guess, but 
uh, an outcome of having to manage uh, with that out, uh, ideal conditions so that you have to make adjustments in, in some cases, which were long overdue anyway. Completely agree. Yeah. It's time for the, everything needs to evolve to fit this new world. So I think, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see what, what positives will, you know, positives will come out of this for students. How about your current year students? Have they been affected at all? Have you tried to accelerate their timeline? I saw, I think it was New York University. They have been, you know, trying to graduate their students a little bit earlier to get them out. Have you guys done a similar thing? Well, we're, we're looking at it. Uh, there's a big push in New York. There's 17 medical schools in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and they all belong to an organization called AMSTE, which is the Association of Medical Schools of New York. So the deans of these schools, including myself, meet regularly. And we've been in you know, contact, daily contact lately. Uh, and NYU uh, does plan uh, to graduate their students uh, early, uh, mm -hmm. their fourth year seniors, uh, so that they can start their NYU sponsored residency programs uh, a little bit early and help out in, in, in this crisis. Mm -hmm. Not all the medical schools you know, are in the same situation as NYU is. Not all of us have our own sponsored residencies or our own hospitals. Uh, so it's a little bit more of a challenge for us. And we, we also have to make sure the students have completed all their requirements uh, in order to graduate. So mm -hmm. we're still, uh, you know, reviewing who would be eligible for early graduation uh, or not. Uh, but we're definitely leaning towards an early graduation. Graduation would be June 1st. Okay. Uh, if it's possible, we, we might be able to graduate students May 1st or even a little bit earlier, but we need all their um, rotations completed, uh, all their boards passed, you know, so they have to still meet our graduation requirements. And, and that's probably the rub at this point, because uh, as of today, maybe 30% of our students would be eligible for an early graduation based on requirements. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we, we have to, we're working on it. And there's, uh, letters as recently as this morning going to the state asking for permission because it's also unclear mm -hmm. if students who graduate early would be eligible to do anything because they're if they're no longer medical students and they're not yet residents what are they yeah uh, <laughs> you know maybe they're volunteers but if they're volunteers you know uh, what what about their health insurance uh, what about the malpractice coverage uh, you know there's a lot of details Mm -hmm. And there's actually no mechanism right now uh, in New York for them to actually work in the hospital. So we're working on trying to find a legal mechanism whereby um, early graduates from medical school would have some kind of classification mm -hmm. that would allow them to work, um, you know, in the hospitals until July 1st, which is when their residency start anyway. Got it. Okay, that makes total sense. And so if they match to a program outside of New York, you know, there's some issues because quarantine time, yeah. et cetera, and so forth. And, you know, so the hospital, if they matched in Chicago to a mm -hmm. hospital there, you know, they're going to want them early for orientation and all those kind of things. And if they're volunteering in a at-risk hospital in New York, uh, they probably have to be quarantined 14 days. And so, you know, there's, re it's complicated and there's repercussions to everything. So, you know, we're looking at it very carefully, very closely to yeah. see if we can do it. That makes total sense. And a lot of moving parts and happening so quickly too. If it, you are going to do May 1st, that's just a month away. So not a lot of time yeah. to figure it out. Yes. Yes. It's, it's just a month away. And uh, yes, it, it is, is a challenge and we, <laughs> You know, again, we have to make sure that everybody's completed all the medical school mm -hmm. requirements because that's what we promised our accreditors and mm -hmm. licensing boards. And, you know, we can't just graduate people because we, you know, feel yeah. like it's a good thing to do. We, yeah. we also have to, you know, follow the standards. For sure. How are you guys handling more of like the hands-on classes that you might have, like students might have to take? <laughs> of course, like there's a lot of online like learning lecturing but what about like more hands-on like lab work that they might right have? like anatomy lab or physical yeah. diagnosis class you know those have all been suspended uh, for now uh, so all the classes that were not labs are being given online which is about 80 percent of the curriculum yeah. and the other 20 percent is delayed uh, and the students will likely get incomplete for those courses until such time as those things can be completed 
we're looking at alternatives, you know, even online alternatives for anatomy lab and, and what have you. Uh, but, but those things are more challenging because, you know, labs usually require in-person participation, which we cannot do. The school yeah. is physically closed at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. So the labs are closed and, you know, there's, there's no way to do it. So would they have to start again that, you know, the class from the start or would it start like kind of with the point where you finished? I don't know. Just, the, just the lab piece. Usually there's a lab piece and a okay. lecture piece. Okay. So that they will have completed the lecture piece. So okay. we'll just bring them back. Uh, so like in uh, college, you maybe you have a three credit chemistry course with a one credit lab. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so we would complete the three credit part, but the one credit part, we would have to wait until we're uh, able to open the lab again. So they wouldn't have to take any exams again. It would just kind of be the physical hand on kind of. Stuff. Well, only the exams that are related to the lab, you okay. know, each of the labs has its own kind mm -hmm. of exam just to make sure the proficiency. Uh, yes. is there you know an assessment so they would still have the assessment related to the lab but they okay. would have completed the rest of the you know, okay. requirements good because i know those are tough classes and so i can't imagine <laughs> getting through most of it and then getting the incomplete and having to oh yeah <laughs> listen the, the students have been amazing our students have been uh not only doing their online classes and taking their online tests but many of them are also been volunteer you can look at our website the turocom uh, Middletown website, uh, Turo.edu, and you can see what our students have been doing, but they've been volunteering at the health departments and uh, scheduling uh, patients and following up on things and, you know, supporting the emergency responders and in a non-clinical fashion, really supporting the public health efforts uh, in our community. And the, the students all have done this, you know, voluntarily, not for pay, not for credit, but they're just, they want to do something, they can't just sit still, so. Uh, the students have been a high percentage of our students have been very active in volunteering. Wow, that's really amazing. Yeah, a very critical support role too, I'm sure. In this, not yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they've been good supports about the the uh, good sports about the whole thing. I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, interrupted their medical education in many yeah. ways and been a big disruption to their lives. And uh, but our our students have been very resilient and uh, you know very. Uh, accommodating and uh, I would say 90% of our 95% of our students are you know do, doing a great job. Wow amazing. Okay um, for this upcoming cycle do you have any advice for students who want to apply to your school? Uh, sure uh, you know uh, I, would, I would continue to do as much of what you were doing before mm -hmm. uh, whether it's volunteering uh, how you're preparing for a medical career. Uh, stay up with the current uh, information about the pandemic. Uh, you know, know what's going on. Stay current. Uh, listen to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, you know, who's giving the scientific part of the press conferences and stuff. Uh, but really, you know, embed yourself at least online uh, in terms of you know what's happening out there. Uh, you know, with this pandemic and what. Healthcare professionals are doing. There's all kinds of stuff on Facebook and Twitter, you know, where you can really keep up with what's going on the front lines and uh, stay safe and wash your hands and uh, stay home and uh, do all the things. You know, number one, you know, stay try to stay healthy, mm -hmm. uh, and, and number two, try to volunteer if you can, and, and number three, keep up with everything that's going on and uh, just uh, continue on with your you know, your education and. Uh, stick with it don't give up you know resilience and uh, you know a medical career is not a sprint uh, you know it's a marathon uh, so have the end game long term in mind and uh, just stick with stick with it don't give up and uh, there may be some slight delays because of circumstance but you know not, nothing good uh, comes without uh, waiting exactly yeah it'll happen too and in this time, we have no clue how long it's going to last. So patience, I think, is definitely the key. Yeah, no, nobody knows. I mean, I get asked all the time by our students and by the public and others, when is this going to end? And you know, who can yeah. say? I mean, I, I, I have great faith in the American medical system and our research capability and to find a, va a vaccine or a treatment that works well or for the virus just to take its course and, and disappear. Uh, but 
uh, I know that everything is being done by the American medical system and the amazing healthcare professionals that we have uh, to get us through this. And and people should you know, do what they what they should need to do as well by staying home and staying safe. Yes, trying to flatten the curve, helping the professionals by not going anywhere and clogging up the hospitals even more. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. Yeah, nobody wants to be, you know, stuck at home and all that, but it's, it's the safest place right now, so. Yeah, we'll do our part so the doctors can do their part, so hopefully. Yeah, it's flatten the curve, right? Yeah, that's all we can do. Well, at least that's all I can do. <laughs> I can't do much more, but that's what I can do. Okay, I just have one more question for you, and it's not quite related to coronavirus, but I don't know how like closely you are looking at the extracurriculars and like you know resumes of your applicants. But is there any um, like extracurriculars or achievements that you really like to see applicants achieve, or you know a way to like any advice for applicants to take their interest to the next level or anything along those lines? Well, we look uh, really at Turo, uh, especially in Middletown, we look for very well-rounded applicants. So we like to see uh, that they've done other things uh, besides uh, medical type stuff or besides sitting around studying. So we look for people who've been athletic, especially in, in team sports. I'm a big basketball person and we actually have a basketball team at our school which travels and plays against other medical schools and other healthcare schools and competes in tournaments and, and such. And you know, the team sport aspect of it to me is very appealing. So I look for people who are well around and maybe participate in sports or music or art or some other uh, hobby or um, activity that makes them a you know, well-rounded kind of candidate for our school because I think there's things to be learned. People that have some work experience so they know what it's like you know, mm -hmm. to have a boss and to, to work and make money and support themselves. So life experience you know, becomes very important as well. Um, and some medical experience, we like to see people who know a little bit about what they're getting into, uh, you know, medicine, career, the education part especially, is a lot of sacrifice and studying and, you know, not going out and partying when mm -hmm. with your friends, but staying home and studying for the anatomy exam. Yeah. So we like to see that they have some commitment and focus, uh, you know, as well, and perhaps some research background is nice as well. So if, if nobody has all these things that I'm describing. <laughs> But yeah. some people, some people, it's a lot. So it's somebody, some people have some of these things. So, and we look for some passion, you know, what makes them tick and, and you know, what makes them get up in the morning, and, uh, what their passion is in life. And so people that have a strong passion, whether it's uh, rescuing uh, stray animals mm -hmm. or uh, helping the homeless or some other passion, selfless. Uh, you know, that they do, which shows their empathy and compassion for uh, animals or humans. Uh, you know, we like to see something like that, too. So, you know, we like we look for good people with a good heart that, you know, are, are selfless and, and like to care for, for others. Okay. How important is, like, having a second language skill, would you say? Uh, it's good, uh, certainly. Well, we, we do look for uh, cultural um, diversity. Mm -hmm. So we do look for underrepresented minorities in medicine, which is, you know, most particularly African American mm -hmm. or Hispanic, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, patients generally like to see doctors that look like them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a, a terrible small amount of African American physicians, especially African American men which is like maybe 4% of all physicians, ridiculously low, and Hispanic is, is not that much better. Uh, so we do look for uh, cultural diversity uh, in our class, and included in that is language. So if you are Spanish speaking or have a different language that you speak, that has appeal because in some communities that may be the only language that they speak, okay. and you're gonna be much more effective as a physician and. a Hispanic community if you're able to speak Spanish. So that is something we, we like to see or if you know you're uh, not Hispanic but you do speak Spanish that's a, that's also a positive okay. as well and we also have medical Spanish courses at the medical school mm -hmm. so people can learn medical Spanish uh, who, 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 are, who are not Spanish speaking. So language is very important. I would put that under the broad heading of cultural uh, diversity uh, but I would encourage people who are from um, 
diverse groups to apply to our medical school. Uh, it is part of our mission, uh, so we do look very closely at uh, underrepresented minorities uh, for our school. And we also look very closely at local uh, kids because part of our mission is to uh, train physicians for this, the area we're in, uh, Orange County, New York, uh, we're next to Sullivan County, New York. We're uh, kind of upstate New York, or maybe 60 miles north of New York City. Mm -hmm. And we do, you know, there is a acute physician shortage and healthcare crisis in this area, even without the pandemic. Uh, so, yes. you know, we're looking for people who are willing to commit uh, to more rural areas. Uh, you know, some people are committed to working in Manhattan, for instance. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's not, you know, our mission. There's, you know, 14 medical schools in Manhattan and, yeah. uh, you know, to, to train those people to, who want to work in Manhattan. We're a little bit more outside of the Manhattan area. Mm -hmm. we're, we're 60 miles north of the city, which isn't very far. I mean, Buffalo and Syracuse are much further than us, but, yeah. but we're not in, in Manhattan. So, uh, you know, and the best way to have physicians commit to an area is to recruit people from that area and train them to be physicians. Uh, so, so those are some of our focus areas. That being said, uh, about 50% of our students are from outside of New York. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah, California, Texas, all over the place. So, uh, so about half are from the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area of our students, and about half are from the entire rest of the United States, and a few from, a few from Canada. Got it. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're pretty much open. It's not like you only are focusing on that. No, yeah. Not at all. And not at all. Uh, we're, we're very open. Uh, you know, we, we try to take the best candidates, uh, you know, best applicants. And uh, some will stay here, some won't. About 60% of our graduates go into primary care, mm -hmm. oh. uh, about uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, or mm -hmm. family medicine, uh, which is pretty high. Yeah. Uh, we have about 25% underrepresented minorities, which is pretty high. Uh, most medical schools run less than 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have more women than men uh, for the last three years. Wow. Uh, and we have more women applicants and more women students than men uh, for some know. reason. Um, <laughs> so, so that's our school. Yeah. Our school has a very low attrition rate, less than 2%. Uh, pretty that's much everybody cool. who starts here you know, makes it to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, we have some pretty unique programs. We have a horse uh, training program uh, where the medical students all work with horses at a local horse farm uh, as part of their uh, nonverbal uh, skills and communication mm -hmm. abilities. If you can okay. get the, the horses to listen to you, you might be able to get patients to listen <laughs> to you. The horses being prey animals are very sensitive to tone and touch and all that. So we work on that aspect of the of the students' armamentarium. We have yoga every day. We have uh, dog therapy uh, three times a week. Uh, we have um, YMCA membership for all our students and faculty, which we use all the time. Uh, so it's a very active, vibrant campus. Uh, very um, uh, a lot of group learning, a lot of peer support, a lot of group activities. Uh, and a uh, very high graduation rate and match rate. We matched 97% of our graduates wow. in this recent match, which was a couple of weeks ago on March 20th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the national average was uh, 90% for DOs, 93% for MDs, and we matched 97% That's amazing. graduates directly into a residency program. Yeah, and it's actually really nice that they're all primary care because that's such a shortage too, so that's a valuable uh, you know, service that these students are providing as well. Yeah, so we really stress primary care. Most of our clinical faculty are primary care physicians. And uh, yeah, we really focus on the primary care aspect. Because like you said, that's who takes care of people. Um, yeah, and, we need know, them. The, most people in the community are cared for by a primary care physician. And uh, yeah. so, so we need to produce more. And I think everybody recognizes that. Good, that's awesome. Well, it was really nice learning more about the school and kind of getting your thoughts on the whole pandemic as well. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. Do you have anything else you want to add about anything in general? Um, not really. Uh, just uh, think about, uh, everybody should think about the healthcare workers, the people on the front lines, uh, the efforts that everybody's making, uh, the commitment and 
how we're all in this together and uh, how we'll all get through this together. I love it. And, uh, how it really points out our, our similarities rather than our differences. And yes. How we, we all need to pull together to get through this. Yep. And we all need to stay home. <laughs> stay home. Yes. Stay home for now. <laughs> Hopefully it'll end uh, fairly soon. But yep. right. Stay home and stay, stay safe. Now.